takes a second. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Tinseltown Live with Ms. Meliz. I'm Melissa Reyes, and I have with me a very special friend, a wonderful person. Her name is Ruth Curran, and she's the author of Being Brain Healthy. And we have had, I've had the um, wonderful happen Dance, I guess the wonderful experience of speaking with her on Tinseltown before. So this is her second time here on Tinseltown, and um, and we've met in person, which is always exciting to uh, get a chance to meet someone that I've met online and through Tinseltown, which is fantastic. And um, we, she has some wonderful tales to tell me about and to share with all of you. So I'm going to ask her to tell us about herself. But first, before I do, I just want to say hi to a few people who are here already. It's great to see Cindy and Kevin and um, and anybody else who's watching. Thank you so much for being here. And I look forward to, to um, having a little uh, question and answer after we have our discussion. So thank you for, for hanging out with us. Ruth, tell us about yourself. Welcome to Tinseltown. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be back and such a pleasure always. I love talking to you, Melissa, every time we talk. It's just such a pleasure. Um, I, As you said, I wrote a book called Being Brain Healthy, and that was – um, as a result of my experience from a brain injury, um, going on 13 years now, going on 13 years ago, and the recovery process um, was interesting and enlightening. And what came out of that was all of these uh, ways to live better, all of these ways to turn up the volume on your life, and actually activate your brain. And some of the things that I talk about in the book um, are what I call the bees of brain health. Um, be active, be engaged, be purposeful, be involved in your life, be complicated, be unexpected. Do all those things that make you who you are and all the things that you love and that will activate your brain and make your life better and make you think better in the long run, too. So travel is one of those things um, that is a, a multi-purpose brain activator. You can activate your senses. You can uh, do brand new things. You can experience things from different people's perspective. It's all very cool. It is so cool. It you guys, isn't she cool? I just I love listening to Ruth. Ruth, remind me, were you a brain expert before you had the injury? Um, I have a master's. In, well, actually, after my brain injury, I got a master's in psychology. But before then, I was working in organizational psychology. So, you so um, I've always been, yeah, I've always been focused on psychology and that human interaction. What happened after the brain injury is I got really interested in how everyday behaviors, how everyday life affects brain activity mm -hmm. and how all of those little things that we do every day affect our brain. Like what? I got an echo. Do you have an echo? Uh, yeah, it comes and goes. I, I fi I'm fine. Okay. Do you have any other windows open? No, Turn Facebook off if you have that. Yeah, it's off. Everything is off. Okay, I'm turning mine off. Everything is off. The only <laughs> thing that's on is time. Yeah, that's okay. Oh, I hear it now. Mm -hmm. Might be my microphone as well. Yeah. Okay. But well, um, last night I was interviewing um, Gina Doyle, and she uh, the whole time we were talking uh, on Smile Time. I heard an echo and I was just feeling so badly because the conversation was going great. And I was thinking this just is going to be terrible, but the playback, you can hear it. It was sounded great. Cool. So cool. We'll, we'll, we'll just ignore it. We'll do yeah. the, our best to ignore it. Right. We'll do the best. Okay. Yeah. All yeah. right. Well, so, <clears throat> so you were saying your, your background is in psychology, but then you learned about these little things, you know, that are improve are you saying improve or activate the brain as mm -hmm. you're every on a daily basis? 
Yeah, and I think I think, and I don't know if you and I talked about this or not before, but I think one of the things that we think about when we talk about, um, you know, focusing on your life, we always talk about going in, you know, bring, meditate, mindfulness is is bringing it inside and finding that calm. I think there's a point in our lives where you embrace that energy. And you, know, you start feeling the energy. And instead of saying, oh, this is weird, I need to bring this back to center, step into that energy. Step into that little bit of excitement and see where it takes you. Turn the volume up just a little bit and see how far you can go. I think that we take ourselves to new heights by just exploring and stepping into our wonder, you know, stepping into this world that we don't experience inside it's all out here Mm -hmm. and when we let it pass us by we're missing a huge opportunity yeah you know we get so into our routine and kind of like a mundane this is how we always have done it this is how we're going to do it and when you um you know stop stop feeling or getting excited about things we don't always recognize it for me it's when i stop and think you know what isn't it pretty here you know or just a little something you know to change my outlook and then I then I think what was I thinking that was really bogging me down everything's great yeah yeah and there's there's another little trick that I absolutely love I when when things are feeling stressful and I'm feeling like everything is just kind of piling in on me I like to take a step back and say isn't that interesting yeah. You know, isn't that interesting? <laughs> and it really gives you a different perspective. It's like it's like shifting your chair 10% and looking at it from an entirely different view. You see so much more. You feel so much more. Yeah. Yeah. And every time brain um, health in general is about those connections in the brain. It's about keeping all of those pathways alive and active. And the more things you can do, the more ways you can step into that wholeness that's you and activate and light up more areas in your brain, the better off you're going to be in the long run. And we don't necessarily do that by going inside, by, you know, calming the noise. Sometimes it helps to turn up the noise. That's interesting. That's interesting. I was just having a conversation with my son last night about turning down the noise and, and just kind of, because he's so busy and he gets so stressed and he's having a little pain here. And he's like, mom, it's my lungs. Mm -hmm. You know, I have something wrong. I said, you know, that's stress, honey. You you know, you're, you're with the breathing feels shallow. You know, you're having anxiety. He's had anxiety before. I said, let's just relax. Let's, you know, for just, just try to to quiet those voices and think about, you know, how good things are and count your blessings and all the things that, you know, we did a heart breath exercise where, mm-hmm. we, you know, we're thinking about um, things that make us smile while we, you know, so that later he could just activate that feeling by just tapping his heart. And so, right. you know, Oh, that's really powerful. Was, yeah. Right. We to brought- activate it later to yeah. give a trick. That's a what a wonderful tool you gave him. That's great. And I just I, I do that a lot. And so now, like, I'll find myself just putting my hand here, and that's usually calming for me. And um, yeah. and so you know, but the flip side of that is getting excited, getting energy, um, right. you know, turning up the volume. I love that. Tell me more. Yeah. Tell me more. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's, just, it's not. It's not only turning up the volume. Sorry. Um, it's not only turning up the volume on what's happening. Sometimes I think there are different phases that we go through in life where you feel energy. I mean, you can almost feel it coming out of your body. You can feel it radiating. You can feel the excitement from within and it's foreign. And sometimes it's a little frightening when things get like that it, in it. You know, we have that tendency to say, yes, this is anxiety. And in many cases, it is anxiety. Sometimes, however, it's just an elevated level of energy. 
and it's something just to step into and to explore and to expand upon, if that makes any sense at all. I think yeah. that we can activate our energy and really turn up the noise on life and step into a higher vibration of energy without getting too woo-woo, you know. Um, it's, it's stepping into that and owning, this is my power. Right. You know, um, I don't need to pull it in. It's okay to make it fly, to let it fly. We talked also, my son and I, about um, it. the, it, well, what we, oh gosh, I lost my train of thought, what you just said about um, energy and having it be about um, just so much, oh, I know, manifesting. I, I explained to him how, ailments can manifest out of holding stress in. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, um, and my mother taught me about that. You know, she, she had the strong um, mind gut reaction and I do too, like literally get a stomach ache if I'm nervous or excited about something. And, you know, so, um, so she, so I, I was talking to him about that, about how, you know, you have to, you know, there, your body is going to tell you when something's wrong and you've got to know what that feels like that's and that how that is different from the stress manifesting. Right. Okay. Yeah. And you and I had an interesting conversation about this. The last time I was on, we talked about um, we talked about the fact that we know when things are going wrong. You know, we know the signs. We know, OK, my uh, my heart rate, my respiration have elevated. Mm -hmm. Um, something feels funky inside. Something's going wrong. And you want to return to feeling normal. So how often do we know what good is? How often do we take the time to say, okay, this moment's really good. What's my heart rate feel like? What's my respiration? How does this, the air feel on my skin at this moment? So when we talk about returning to good, you got to know what good feels like. Right. What's your starting point? Where is your level? Yeah. What's right? your norm? Yeah. What's your norm? Your best, your best Where do you norm. want to return? Yeah. Where do you want to return? Yeah. And well, so that's you know, another kind of thing that we just don't think about. Um, we, we always know, we always have those indicators of things are too high, too low. Mm -hmm. But that level... You know, that comfortable spot, that spot where you really want to live, where you feel like, oh, I've hit my stride. I'm, you know, this is my lane and I want to stay right here. We don't think about what that really feels like. Yeah. How do you know this feel? Pardon me? When you say it, that is like, you know, that feeling when you're in the groove, when things mm -hmm. are going, you're, you know, I guess going your way or just – you're, you're in that, your element, and it's comfortable, and it's, you know, it's exciting. You know what that feels like when you're doing right. it. Yes. So, yes. Think, bring yourself back. Take to moments that. and focus on that. Mm. You know, um, make that part of your cell memory, for lack of a better way of saying it. You know, talk about muscle memory. You repeat something and repeat something and repeat something, mm -hmm. and then you go back to it naturally. Right. Right. Um, it's the same thing with how you feel. You feel it in your cells. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you are um, so intuitive. We always get on these little talks. And, and <laughs> we do, don't we? Right. Yeah. What I want to hear about. You know, today we're talking, uh, you were going to tell me about your recent trip to Tanzania. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, I always love for people to learn your story about um, what you went through and how you wrote um, Being Brain Healthy and also the Brain Game. What's that called? Cranium crunches. Yeah. Cranium crunches. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so I think that it's important to talk about that. And then we can cock our frou frou life life. You got it. You got <laughs> it. So, and, and you know what's interesting is that the this whole volunteer travel thing, this whole path that I've gone down was a result of writing the book and the result of, um, finding avenues for people to actually be purposeful and to activate and to turn up the noise on their lives. 
So I was looking for purposeful travel because that to me seemed like the perfect combination of being purposeful, being engaged and being active. Learning new things, experiencing new culture, diving in fully. Uh So I started exploring those kinds of things. Um, My husband and I went on a volunteer vacation um, where we went to a reef. We went to uh, this little tiny island in Belize and we did a reef preservation project, which was fascinating. We became citizen scientists. And so when I got back from that trip, you know, we cataloged fish and we learned how to measure shells. We scuba dived. So it was, you know, merging all these passions on this island that was 100 paces this way and 125 paces that way. Oh, my God. Yeah, it was a very cool experience. So when I got back, I started researching more volunteer vacations, and I came across Global Volunteers. Um, They had this project that was, uh, the focus was to elevate, to uh, raise the IQ of a nation. So, of course, you know, I'm talking volunteer travel. And I see this video with this amazing video with, you know, children's brains reaching their potential. And I thought, wow, match made in heaven, right? So I wrote an email to um, the co-founder, Michelle Grand, and I said, hey, can I interview for you for my blog? Um, I'm writing about this stuff. I want to give some people some options. She wrote back and said, sure. We scheduled 30 minutes on the phone. Um, I think almost two hours later. Oh yeah, you know, that doesn't we, surprise we me. Just, she's <laughs> absolutely amazing. She is this, you know, you would adore her. Mm-hmm. And I should interview her. She's amazing. I would um, love to. It's global volunteering. Is the global is volunteers? The, yeah. Oh, and yes. I, the more, so I started writing about global volunteers. I started writing about this project in Saint Lucia. And it took about a year, but I finally went to called Reaching Children's Potential. Um, it was the first part of the demonstration project where um, it, you know, it's providing what they call the 12 essential services that are required for children to grow and be nurtured and to live in an environment that supports a good possibilities, you know, where you're saying to people, you can't reach your potential unless you have this basic foundation. And these 12 essential services they've outlined um, beautifully support potential. Okay. You know, and then it's up to the individual to do whatever they wish with that potential or whatever opportunity arises. But it's the it's the crime of not having that that groundwork that we all take for granted. You know, good education, good nutrition. Um, people who make eye contact with us, you know, social supports, psychosocial support, and safety. Some, some fr- yeah. background a little. Stay, step back. Like, from what yeah. framework are they coming into this? No, how do they know that they need that? Thirty-three years of experience um, working in countries with children. Tons and tons of research. I mean, everything is evidence based, Melissa. Everything Uh is evidence based. Everything is from practical experience and from research. Okay. And it's all of these things that we know, we all know that children need to thrive and be contributing citizens. Yes. And again, it's those things that we take for granted every day. You know, it's basic sanitation. Those types of things. So, you know, and and these are wonderful communities with wonderful people that Global Volunteers works in. They come in as um, an invitation of community partners only. Mm -hmm. And that's what was the big differentiator for me. You know, I started looking around at different organizations and there are a whole bunch of organizations that drop in, think they know best. You know, you can that's come in and you come in and you're the expert and blah, blah, blah. Global Volunteers only operates at, at the invitation of an in-country partner. And then within that framework, establishes these wonderful relationships with schools, with hospitals, with governmental agencies, with churches, with community groups, and fills needs. You know, you actually go and serve. 
So I, I took about a year and I went to St. Lucia. Um, and I knew I was going to enjoy it. I knew it was going to be satisfying. I had no idea what to expect. I did not expect that I would come back changed. And I came back with a changed heart. What changed? And a changed perspective. Really? Yeah. Did you expect that? No, I didn't expect that at all. <laughs> I went in. Uh, patience? Well, I tried not to. Yeah. But we always have expectations, yeah. you know. Um, I mean, I, I knew I was going to be, um, I, I thought I was going to be going in and working on I, the part of the Reaching Children's Potential program that was gardens. They supply these things called earth boxes to the families. Okay. I, and I got there and I was all prepared to do that. And then all of a sudden they didn't have supplies. So I'm an elementary school mentor instantly. That's what you, that's, that became your mission. Is that what you're saying? Yes, that became I my see. mission. <laughs> yep. Okay. So that was the first shift. And then there were these series of shifts where, um, and I'm not sure exactly where it happened, but it was from where I made that shift from giving, from a giving heart, from a giving perspective, from a philanthropic life focus to actually serving in mm -hmm. being there to serve whoever was there, whatever need that was. And my preconceived notions, my cultural notions did not matter and were not relevant. My purpose became serving whatever need I needed to serve for those people within their cultural framework. No matter how difficult that was for me, that didn't matter. And then all of a sudden it became this life expanding experience. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. So I came back and I wrote about it. You know, that's right. what we do. Right? We come back and we write. Yeah. Um, and I kept in touch uh -huh. with global volunteers and I kept working with them. Um, I expanded my relationship with Michelle. I started serving on the Reaching Children's Potential Advisory Committee because of my air background with the brain and all of those kind of things. And we started developing PowerPoints for um, the families, for the mothers, you know, basic things. I mean, like I developed a couple that were, um, you know, just basics on how the brain, how you build connections in the brain. You know, all those little things, kind of conversations last we had, time. except for the things that, you know, culturally um, eye contact is not what, what is not a, a huge cultural norm. Mm -hmm. But research says that the more eye contact you make, the more words you speak, the more connections you make in the brain. Mm -hmm. So those are the kind of things I started doing. So then there were some shifts in the organization um, and this big opportunity came up. It was the stars aligning in the program in Tanzania where um, reaching children's potential became the focus of global volunteers future in Tanzania. There's an amazing program there now and has been for 30 years, you know, with beautiful relationships. And part of what I did, um, was I went in to help explore whether this was going to be a viable thing in Tanzania, reaching children's potential, um, how reaching children's potential has caregivers going into young families' homes so and working directly children's with children's potential is an organization. No, it is a it's a program okay. that started. Um, yes, and it, it it's a, an offshoot of a program that was started by some government governmental entities there was one in st lucia mm -hmm. um, and it was called the roving caregivers program global volunteers kept rcp and changed it to reaching mm -hmm. children's potential when they took over the program the st lucian government didn't have the funds to continue the program global volunteers stepped in again at the invitation of the community to keep that program going mm -hmm. and what it did is it, it brings um caregivers young women into homes where there are young children and helps, you know, helps mothers interact with their children, 
talk to them about nutrition, talk to them about, um, you know, healthy lifestyles and how to really help elevate your child. And these are amazing young women who are running the program in St. Lucia. This is something that Global Volunteers now wants to take to Tanzania. Um, and one of the um, focuses is to get this program in 100 villages in Tanzania. This is the dream. To get this program in 100 villages in Oringa district, which is in one area of Tanzania. And one of the reasons is, is that stunting that condition where um, children's brains don't develop because of basically because of malnutrition, because of lack of nutrition. It's not lack of food it's lack of nutrition and it's lack of um, the right foods at the right times at the right places and that's lack of education in most cases well so I want you to tell me about this picture um, I'm pulling up from your website Do you see oh that? I love that picture that's one of my favorite pictures that um, that I took in wow. Tanzania. This yeah. was um, this was a, a a trip that a colleague and I took um, to a village, and we had just dropped someone off who needed a ride. Um, and these were this was this woman's family, and they all came out to greet us. And I, of course, asked permission to take the picture. Um, and just it was this beautiful family moment. You know, and it just shows the, um, the difference in lifestyle, but the same connection to family and that same connection to each other. I look at this picture and I get this overwhelming feeling of, um, you know, the mother, the grandmother, and this uncle who came out and mm -hmm. talked to us. You know, and we had just given this woman a ride home who had just delivered a baby less than 24 hours before that's right you were saying so, that you ended up yeah and it was um it would that was a very cool moment very very cool moment i thought thank you for pulling that picture out how of all long, of them how long were you there i was there for three weeks three weeks and, it, yeah. and you saw whole life cycles of families from you know I just did. so just so amazing so um what was the main um Okay, let's see. I'm looking at pictures of St. Lucia, which looks like an island paradise. And then Tanzania, it looks like a rough terrain, you know? Oh, it's spectacular. It's beautiful, so, Melissa. It's absolutely, it's lush, it's gorgeous. Yeah, look at the zebras. This was, um, these were zebras not on, a, um, they have beautiful national parks. Uh -huh. But this was just on the way from one place to another. You know, this was <laughs> yeah. on my commute. This is I like ran into zebras. seeing cows they, on the <laughs> side of the road. <laughs> <laughs> they made eye contact. But it's just, it's such they a made eye contact. crazy to think about it, isn't it? Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. So, mm -hmm. so the cult, so the, so what was your general impression? Um, you know, of the infrastructure and, uh, you know, what's the hope that you want to see happening there and what can we do? Right. There's so much, um, there's so much that's right on the edge for Tanzania right now. They have a new president. There's all kinds of excitement in the country. Um, there's a lot of energy around development mm. in Tanzania right now. Um, one of the more, we, stay, we spent most of our time in a city called Durango, which is a pretty big city. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, we also went to a lot of villages. And I, one of the villages that the one that Global Volunteers had been in for, I believe I might be misspeaking, but it's at least 25 years mm -hmm. in this village. Um, and we, when we went there, it's one, one of the more prosperous villages. You can tell because we were there on a Sunday and you could tell by how people were dressed and, and the hair, you know, mm -hmm. how well people's, you know, color in their hair and um, colorful clothing. And it was a prosperous, you could feel that prosperity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, electricity had gotten there literally the week before we did. 
Oh my God. The power poles arrived the week before we did. Oh wow. That's just yes. like my and that's, mind. it's just it's yeah, it does, it blows your mind. But it's it's a different way of looking at life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not a you know, it's not a better or a worse. It's just different. It's a different step in an evolutionary process. Not saying that this country took all the right steps in all the right order mm. by any stretch of the imagination. There are opportunities in Tanzania right now to um, make decisions about, you know, um, electricity and where that comes from, infrastructure and how that happens. Mm -hmm. All of those things are yeah. happening right now. Mm -hmm. There's so much promise. So much promise. Um, one of the things that really struck me, and I, the research that I did and all of the prep that I did was for this program, this Reaching Children's Potential program, and the goal is to eliminate stunting. So I thought I was going to see this barren land with, um, you know, no crops, no livestock. There's an abundance of food. There's an abundance of livestock. It's just proportioned differently. And the priorities are different. And that's a cultural thing. Mm. You know, um, what's being sold at the market and what's being kept at home to feed the children. Like what? What's, um, well, you know, if you've got chickens and you've got eggs and you've got all of these different, a, a large variety of crops, if you can make more money by selling them, or if you can feed the people who are actively contributing to the economy today, mm -hmm. that's what happens. Mm -hmm. Babies don't necessarily contribute on a large scale. Does that make sense? Oh. And that's not, that's not saying that this is a lesser mentality. It's just a cultural thing. It's a cultural norm. Food distribution is a cultural norm, and we don't think about it. Yeah. That puzzled look on yeah, your face. I'm lost. It's really hard to get past. And I don't know if it's anything I can convey to you with words yeah. without seeing it. I think it's hard. I, I think what you're ahead. saying is that what you experienced was that they have this availability of food and they want to, that's their product. Right. They're not feeding themselves. They're not taking care of their yes. children because that yes. would be like eating their product. And they and that isn't what. Exactly. It'd be like you turning around and chewing on your um, your jewelry. Well, I, think Why, I, would you, I thought about my right? jewelry. like I try not to wear it because I want to sell it. But right. then there are certain pieces that are my that I love. And instead of just making right. it for myself and saying it's OK to keep that one. I'll make two, so, <laughs> you know. It just uh, it it right. is kind of it is kind of like that. I could see that, but so but to let your child starve when you're trying. But you know, is that, that mean that the child has enough nutrition? I mean, has enough okay. has enough calories? And I think I think the thing that's really hard not to pass judgment on. Yeah. Um, is that I I, I don't think that there's a parent that I definitely know there wasn't a parent that I met that did not want to, from the bottom of their heart, do the best thing for their child. Yeah. And what, what Global Volunteers focuses with this RCP program, with Reaching Children's Potential, is to educate, you know, is to provide tools, provide resources, provide um, food source that is for the family only. So you get this earth box, and this earth box is to feed your children. You know, here are leafy greens. Feed this to your children. This is not for sale. You know, we're not dipping into your economy. We are not taking away from your family. There are choices that people make based on day-to-day -day living, day-to-day -day sustainability, and they're all based on available knowledge. Mm -hmm. So deploying that knowledge. You can't know what you don't know to know. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And it's really hard not to pass judgment on that until you actually see that, you know, that dad who wants to do the best thing for his child, period. Right, right, right. There's no well, question about that. 
Yeah, I had this this similar conversation with Lou Redmond the other day, and he's he wants to meet you and talk to you about the traveling for with purpose mm -hmm. because he's been on a couple of trips and has a friend who's doing this similar kind of starting up something right. like that. Um, and anyway, we were t he was talking about the culture shock of going to a different country and seeing what it was like. Mm -hmm. And I was listening to him and I was saying, but what are the similarities that you found, you know, and that's in the human spirit, whereas people, the love is the same everywhere you go, your mothers and children right. and families and, you know, um, just survival and um, to be happy and those basic things that, you know, like you said, you wouldn't meet a family that didn't want what was best for their children, which just... Mm -hmm. You know, it's just different. So that's that's neat. Yeah, that's yeah. eye opening. So mm -hmm. where where what was the biggest thing? Uh, what's still on your mind? How long have you been back now? A few months, right? It's yeah, been, yeah. That was in July. Wow, that was in August. August. Was it okay. July or August? Oh, I don't remember. <laughs> Leaving in July, you probably came back in August. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, because we're talking about it being around my birthday, and I saw you in June. And mm -hmm. um, you were getting ready, and then it was so exciting. Um, but um, yeah, and then I got there, and everything was different. You know, and, and really funny. Um, the the uh, the man who prepared me for all of you know the CEO of the organization had these conversations with me about well, now don't expect anything to actually happen. You're gonna go, and you're gonna explore, and you know. You're very driven and your timetable may not be met, you know, because I, I think things will happen. I'm going to push them. They're going to happen. They're going to happen. Right. Right. So I I walked in. I felt very prepared mm -hmm. um, and I was prepared just to be in the moment, you know, and to do what I needed to do. That was huge for me because I'm a planner. Yeah. So my goal was to have my plan in place. All of my research done, do everything that I possibly could do before I got there, and then just live in the moment while I was there. Good, good, good that you had that plan. That makes sense to me. Right. So I thought, I thought, well, you know, that means I'm on somebody else's timetable, which is cool. So mm -hmm. things may not happen quickly. Um, day two and a half, and things are moving at the speed of light. And I, you know, sent this email and I said, we need to Skype because this is not what you described at all. <laughs> you know, okay. you know, we need to, I, this is really happening and it's happening quickly. And I want to make sure this is something that I'm doing in the right spirit. You know, that it's not something I'm hammering down. But Were here's you the, alone there? What? Were you alone as as were you weren't with a group that was there or were there you was a group, there was a group um global volunteers has teams that go to different locations and i went there at the same time as a team went okay okay my what i did was a little bit different than what the team did um i was i met with all kinds of amazing people um inspired beyond my wildest imagination I um, met people who made me think in ways I didn't know I could. And that was the gift of this trip. One of the, one of the big things for me and one of the th things that convinced me that Global Volunteers is who I thought they were, um, I walked in and on the first day I had meetings with a couple of pretty high level people. And I thought, okay, I've got to go in there and relationship build because, you know, that's what you do. Mm -hmm. You have your rapport built. They don't know who I am. They have, you know, no preconceived notion about me. Here's this strange woman walking in their door. Mm -hmm. um, I walked in with this on the coattails of this beautiful 30 year relationship mm -hmm. that Global Volunteers has nurtured with this organization. Mm -hmm. So I had instant credibility. That's good. You know, the, everything was there for, you know, it, it was like this golden road was paved because of the beautiful relationships that they have. And because of the respect that this organization has mm -hmm. and the two organizations have for each other. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing. It was, it absolutely took my breath away. 
So what it was going back to my question, what are you still thinking about? What what do you wake up when you think about your trip or, or the experience or the post process? What what are you still wanting to be involved in? Um well I've start since I've been back in the last month, actually, I've started um, doing interviews of volunteers that eventually will turn into a podcast right now. It's mm. one to two minute clips. Mm -hmm. And it's about how volunteering one and two minute clips. <laughs> so right? that's beyond my capability. I can't understand. Oh, yeah. That. Well, you and I are, you know, I was thinking, oh, gee, this one's only one hour. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I've got it pared down to an hour. <laughs> right. Exactly. So, um, it's about change and it's about how volunteering can change. You can change, uh, you can in, in affect change, but you also affect a change in yourself. Okay. All right. So I'm at a point where I'm thinking about change, but I'm thinking of it more in terms of growth, you know, <laughs> because I don't think we change and leave what we have or have built. It's just maybe a shift or right. an expansion. So, you know, does that kind of fit into what you're thinking about, like going there and doing that type of service or going to any volunteer situation where you get to be in a totally different atmosphere? Is that, um, you know, is that part of your journey or is it just like when you say you're changed? Are, how, how Explain that to me. How are you a different person? I think I think you you're you're an elevated person. Ah. You're not a different person. You've changed a perspective or changed how you look at a situation or changed how you look at yourself and your role and what you have on a daily basis and what you didn't have for that two or three week period exactly. and how you adapted. And I think it's that um, it's the resilience of the human spirit. And it's our ability to grow and it's our ability to thrive in new situations that sometimes you just need a new situation to allow that to blossom. Right. There were um, in Tanzania, I worked with a team from the University of Oringa and we were putting together the caregiver program, the training program, which um, is you know, we needed it to be culturally appropriate. We needed it to be all of these things. We also, what we needed it to do, though, was to have these people who have probably never been out of their village be able to deal with volunteers mm -hmm. coming in from mostly the United States, mm -hmm. um, mostly professionals. So we had to think of those things. And what that did for me, what change happened in me at that moment, um, is that I had to, I had to, to look at the whole situation in a different light, and it made, it forced me to think differently. It forced me to. Um, a, a woman that I worked with used this term, cultural competency. It forced me to create this cultural competency that I did not have, and to step into that, and imagine. And then think and create based on that whole process. Oh, neat. H had you done any type of volunteer work here before that was on a, any similar level? Yeah. Um, you know? At a similar level. Um, I've always served on boards. I've always been involved. I've always, um, you know, I've always volunteered. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but what about, and I worked, you know, and I was an executive director of a nonprofit for a while, an environmental nonprofit. Okay. And I helped start a couple of um, nonprofit health clinics. So yeah, it's, it's not a new thing for me. Okay. It's just a new way of looking at it. New way of looking at it. Mm. That was a big responsibility. Oh in yeah. What you did. Yeah. And, and so what changed for them? because you were there. Mm, I think, I do believe, I, I hope, I really hope that everybody I work with, under, worked with, understood they were heard 
appreciated and valued. Mm-hmm. Um, they did because you're like I, I. I hope that they did, mm-hmm. and I hope that 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 gave them hope and gave them an impression of one of my main goals was to give them an you know to give everyone I worked with an impression of the type of volunteer they were going to work with. Mm. This is the kind of person you're going to work with. And the better impression I made and the more genuine I could be in that impression, the more groundwork I was laying for those to come. I just can't imagine that that was really hard to do. Just being you and yourself and letting them, you know, experience what it's like to be around Ruth had to be, you know, a good thing for them. Just, you know, yeah, and, I and know it, you wanted to I was work a different it. me, though. You know, wow. I was this, I was this in the moment. <laughs> I and I it wasn't calculated. Is that in the moment me came home with me. That's, that's it. That was the change, right? Yeah. That, that, so you're, so you're that looking at this yeah. differently. Yeah. So, okay, let me, do, let me ask you this then. What things that you used to do, do you stop yourself from doing or saying or thinking now based because of what, what changes you went through on the trip? So like, you know, is it leaving the water running or, you know, little thought processes? I mean, you're like, oh, I never do that anymore never, since I went. I'll never complain about, um, uh, about uh, cheap toilet paper ever again for the rest of my life. <laughs> because you didn't have any. <laughs> or take for granted. There was no toilet paper, was there? Or, or, and what was there, you know, disintegrated on contact. Um, Western toilets, I'll never take for granted again either. Um, you know, the places that the places that volunteers will stay once this program is up. I mean, right now, the place that they stay does have Western toilets. But when you go out in, you know, in people's homes. Stay there, right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm. Um, I'm sorry. Your question again. I got. I got stuck on the the, oh, the silly toilet paper. No, thing. that's okay. I mean, that's when it. That's something you. Um, you know, you are are different because you appreciate things more. But is there anything else that you think, or you know, you're like, I really will never do this again because of my trip, or think that way, or what kinds mm-hmm. of things, you know? How did it right. change? In specifics um I think or I mean I get that's that you've a really been. hard question Melissa that's a really hard question and I think that that started that shifting started. in St. Lucia okay you know I think that when shift when were you in St. Lucia um, uh, that was three years ago so yeah it was two and a half no no no, 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 no. it was two years, two years ago two years ago yeah so it was it was 18 months in between the trip. After I met you. Uh-huh. For the first time. Yeah. I think for the first time. It was. I had not gone yet. And I think what started shifting in me is um, I, I'm less judgmental of people based on cultural norms. My cultural sensitivity, my Uh, cultural competency Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is raised. My appreciation for Mm -hmm. that is raised. It's not that, um, it's not that I was ever judgmental. It's that. um, Preconceived notions. Exactly. Exactly. And I, and I know that I have preconceived notions now. And I know that when I step beyond those, I can do so much more. Right. When I truly drop them and step into that service role instead of the giver role. I mean, we all look at ourselves, you know, good people look at themselves as givers. Mm -hmm. I like to give to people, you know, here, this is mine. Let me share it with you. Let me, you know, let's do this together. That's what you and I think of as good people. Mm -hmm. But there's that, there's that switch where you go into service and it's not, it it sounds like this religious spiritual experience and it's really not. It's a matter of stepping into somebody else's life and not saying, gee, what do I think is best for them? 
But look, being able to step back, look at that situation, truly listen and react to what's happening in the moment. It's that that's so that started to change. Humbling, isn't it? Yeah, it's eye opening. It's heart expanding. It's world exploding. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. very cool. Very cool. Very so cool. where are you going? So where are you going? Mm. No, are you gonna do I'm definitely going to go back to Tanzania at some point. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Um, I want to stay involved with that project, but I've been thinking about where I'm going ne- before then. Yeah. And I don't know yet. So I really don't know yet. Walk me. Well, there's a couple of questions I have for you. You, your husband didn't go on this last trip, right? It was right. just you. Yeah, that's the part that's the longest time we've been apart. It was uh, three weeks apart with. Um, you know, a a 10 hour time difference. And to just not have that sound anymore and all the time and not have your person with you, you know, just being on yourself. That was, had you ever gone on a trip like that, that far or for that long alone? And Um, you even have a traveling companion. No, but I made, I made some, yeah, I made a couple of life friends. Oh, that's, you know, um, and, and I hope I created some relationships in Tanzania that I will rekindle when I go back. You Tell know. me that story about the baby being born and you were driving, the, taking the woman. Um, mm. right, and that was, this was all in off hours. So this wasn't a typical just thing, something that happened to you. The coolest you. experience. It was the coolest experience. And, and I feel kind of selfish talking about it because it was my experience and this and uh, the other woman who came with me, she came, she was on the service program. She was teaching at the university. Mm -hmm. Um, This was a a woman who was a Dean at the university of Washington. And she came on one of the weekend village trips Mm -hmm. and we, um, we were at a clinic and um, this amazing young man was taking us around and showing us the village and, um, we d- went and we met a bunch of people and we viewed the clinic. Um, we were looking at facilities. I was really interested in one of the things I needed to see was if there were records about uh, size of, you know, weight length of babies. Oh, okay. Statistics. And on. Did it keep that? Right. So could we, ha- could we start with a baseline? Right. Right. Um, and every mother carries these cards, you know, they carry them with them. Wow. Their children's record. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So we went to the clinic and, um, one of the, a a woman approached the young man who was driving us and said, can you give us a ride to the next village? And, you know, so he came to, to my colleague and I, and, course we said sure no problem so in piles this new mom with her brand new baby uh her mother two aunts a neighbor (laughs) in the you know in the jeep and we're driving them home thinking you know and and they either would have here's reality they either would have had to walk and i think it was probably seven or eight miles on I was going to ask you know, in beautiful country, mm-hmm. but up and down roads, and she just had a baby. Right, right. Or they would have had to have, you know, taken a motorcycle. Mm. And she just had a baby. Yeah. So and with a motorcycle, that, that's like six people, too. It's like, it's like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the baby and the mom would have taken the motorcycle, and the other people, the entourage, would have walked. Oh. Okay. But I got to sit in the back seat with the mom and the baby, and here was this little tiny baby. It was amazing. One day old. Very cool. So we just gave them a ride, and um, you know, they were extremely gracious. And the grandmother, we were talking to the family um, the best we could. They weren't very. Uh, they didn't speak English much. Um, the young man that we were with you know, spoke and they, I don't believe they were speaking Swahili. I believe they were speaking native tongues, Mm -hmm. you know, other languages. Um, so he was speaking to them. We were asking questions. He was translating for us. Mm -hmm. Um, 
but just the most lovely, loving family. And we're standing there talking to the, you know, to the family. And there's these beautiful little children that you showed the picture of. Mm -hmm. um, and they're looking at the brand new baby, their new family member. Mm -hmm. And the grandmother comes back with this huge um, long thing of bananas. Mm -hmm. a thank you. She went, she took a machete and whacked it off the tree. And brings you. And gave it to the young man who yeah. drove her, which yeah. was, you know, just as a thank you. Yeah. So it's, it was, that was, um, that was a, a, an eye opening day of human kindness. You know, it really was. And then the value so if you of you and I are ever on a trip together and we take an Uber somewhere and I say, give them some bananas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, wait, no, if I hand you the machete, oh, go out into the you know, go out into the forest, whack off this chunk of bananas and put it in the back of the Jeep, right? Okay. Yeah. And okay, so did I re did I remember this wrong or dream this that they named the baby after the guy or something? Oh yeah, that um, that was that's a huge part of the story. Okay. So we, like, um, I didn't the, know about the bananas. That was pretty cool. Though. I did write about that too. I forgot I that I wrote about that. Part. That's and that feels like such a that's the part that feels like um, a self indulgent part. You know, the woman, um, she had named the child. Of course, we asked what the baby's name is. And um, babies don't always have names right away. And they, uh, you know, she had her little card. And so she said to the young man, she said, well, why don't these two ladies name the baby? That was it. Wow. Yeah. And yeah. Like, and we, and we said, of name. yeah, and, and Lisa's daughter's name's Maya, which you know, that's a spectacular. Yeah. So, so Lisa said, how about Maya? And I watched her write, you know, borrow a pen and write M A Y A on the top of that card. And now that's, and the significance of that moment gets lost in the telling. No, but I that feels very self-indulgent. It feels like here's these, you know, arrogant Americans who have to come in and name the children. It was like this honor. You know, yeah. it was this yeah. amazing moment, and it was um, a, a stepping into their lives, which was yeah. very cool. Well, it's definitely um, a memory of yours that you shared that you wrote about when you came back, and I found it remarkable. And thank you for sharing that with me yeah you're welcome yeah. so and anybody watching <laughs> yeah. so um what do you want people to take from hearing your story how like what do you want to motivate people to volunteer or to be open to that or to, what is your main message right now yeah volunteering um in another country isn't for everybody but i think it's for a lot of people I really do. I think it's a heart expanding experience. Um, it's it's a, a, a gift that you can give yourself. Who is the person who could do this? Is it retired person or a wealthy person yes. or just anybody? Yes. 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 Just anybody. Yes. Just anybody. Yeah. yes. 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 There aren't a whole lot of there aren't a whole lot of no's. If you could take you a break from your life anyway. to become The Bachelor, you could take a break from your <laughs> life to go and visit yeah. another country, right? Yeah, and everybody can, you know, it, everybody can contribute in some way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, it's that whole ability to leave your mark on the world, you know, to just to, to, to leave some place just a little bit better than you found it for the right reasons in the right way. There are a lot of organizations out there, and I did an awful lot of research before I got involved with Global Volunteers. Mm -hmm. um, and they're the right organizations for the right reasons. And walking in those doors with that 30 years of credibility and, you know, and having instant acceptance. Yeah. 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 Just put the exclamation point behind it for me. You didn't have to question what you're, no. you know, whatever. Oh, no. Yeah. No. That's good. No, the relationships were mine to blow. Yeah. That, that, That's that, that responsibility I was saying, you know, but you're the right person. So how do they vet you? Do they, 
you know, train you or? We just, mm, I, oh, there's an application process for volunteers. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, I guess. I mean, they wouldn't want to send anybody there. I mean, you have expertise in the area that they were looking for. So obviously that was a match. But how do they match people? Do they just, you know, I guess there's a process. Yeah, well, there there is. But the cool thing is that um, most often people who don't do what they do in their daily lives learn the most and contribute the most. Yeah. You know, there yeah. are um, what I did. In, yeah, what I did in Tanzania was very different than a normal service program. What mm -hmm. I did in St. Lucia was absolutely representative of a service program. I did one on one tutoring with uh, children who needed a little bit of extra attention, you know, needed that little bit of a, a spark. Hmm. These class sizes are big, like everywhere else in the world. There's too many children in a classroom. Yeah. So the more one-on-one -on -one time you can give to a child, the better they're going to absorb those. Concepts. Can you believe it's seven o'clock? I oh, know. Wow. I can know. we have two more hours, please? Oh, I love yeah. talking. We, we, I just have to tell everybody one time when we were talking on Tinseltown and it got dark and we hadn't we weren't really like into the lighting situation at the time yet right. and we didn't plan for it and we were basically talking to like a faceless screen <laughs> just right. talking right. and letting yeah. it, letting the camera roll or whatever i don't know what i ever did I, with all that footage I think, I think your other guests didn't show up someone was supposed to come like an hour in and that's and why i used to have it so long because i would have multiple guests the same night right. so we just kept talking. I yeah. could talk to you forever, but um, we. But I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do that. But I do want to ask you what. Um, hmm. Let me see. I had a. I, I didn't. You know. I don't plan my questions anymore like I used to. But um, we. You talked a lot about change and about growth and about. Um, being open and so what advice would you give somebody who's listening who just wants to to make a difference what you know what would you give that advice and then I have another question for you so like just some general advice to someone who's searching what would they should they do you know they want to make a difference there's a I think the best way to make a difference is to um, to have a beginner's mind, hmm. you know, walk into a situation for the first time. Don't be all know it all. Just go in and yeah. learn. Le listen closely. Pay attention to all the cues that are around you. Hmm. Pick up on what everybody is saying, and the tone of voice and the feeling, hmm. and step out of step out of yourself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's yeah. wonderful another question or actually just on just just to end this um could you give me some brain crunchers some little few things to improve my um connections and make sure that i'm still i don't know healthy up here yeah i'm um, good ones so you want some everyday brain healthy tips yeah um, activate your senses use more of your senses use scents if you could look around my desk i have like aromas and i've got a candle burning and i've got you know everything you could possibly imagine um <laughs> do fo close your eyes and hone in on the, your other senses make that a practice food, sensory experience yeah, yeah. You know, make breathing a sensory experience. Feel that breath as it comes in. Feel the energy that it activates. You mean Feel you things. automatically yeah. always do all of these things. <laughs> yeah. I guess the people I surround myself with do, and then I'm used to that. But you're right. You have to, you know, what else? Turn it up. Instead of, you know, the next time you have that, that inclination, to dial it back. Oh, everything's feeling just it's that's just a little bit too much. 
you know, instead of saying, okay, I got to pull it in, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, go inside, meditate, calm it, mm -hmm. step into it, see what happens. That is great. That is a turn whole up different noise. Way of things, looking at things. Yeah, really. turn up the noise. Yeah. And you activate the more things that happen in your brain at one time, the more pathways you're activating. Make it complicated. Interesting. More <laughs> steps. Complicated is that. not hard. Yeah. Complicated is not hard. Complicated, just by complicated, I mean multi layered. Yeah. Yeah. More steps, more, more. Yeah value more quality and, yeah. and you know and more quality more richness more beauty yeah wow you're so deep oh <laughs> I, you. I just love it. it well thank you do you feel like you've shared everything you wanted to share oh, on tinseltown yeah. and with me yeah okay thank you thank you so much oh always a pleasure you're always welcome and um i'm gonna I'm going to listen back and, and take out some of these wonderful gems of, of things that you've said and share that on my blog and hope you can put it on your blog too. And we'll just hope mm -hmm. that somebody somewhere listens. Yeah. So, thank you. Right, my dear. Thank you. Have a great thank day. Everyone who, who showed up and listened too. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for being here on Tinseltown live with Ms. Meliz. Thank you um, for listening to my good friend here, Ruth Curran, the author of being brain healthy and um, just take a breath and listen. Close your eyes and listen. That's what I'm going to go do right now. So have a great night, everyone. Thank you, Ruth. You can stay here for a second. I'm just going to say goodbye to Facebook. Goodbye, Facebook. <laughs>